There was a question posed in reference to how slavery is not connected to work. But we're going to have to go into a little bit more of a history, a bigger understanding. I'm going to start from the beginning. In the video, I mentioned that men created slavery. But slavery was always about S-E-X. We're going to start from a baseline so we can have a better understanding about what I meant by that. Men are driven by two things, sex and power. And it is in that order. Our first interaction with the term slavery comes with when men thought that the divine gave them rulership over the others. They called it kingship. Kingship came from the idea that the divine, i.e. religion, also happened here as well. Kingship was directly related to religion and as such, they have the divine right over others. These people would go into territories and you take people for the purposes of sex and power, making people captive. They would go and catch these people, bring them to their territory, from the other villages. They would be kept as maidservants. The males, they just called them slaves. And the children, they would just call them slaves. Which history does not clarify. What were these? Let's talk about it. A maidservant, i.e. female slave, she could be called a concubine, She was someone that was taken as a person that you can have S-E-X with. She would have the children of the king or whomever the king gave her to. Uh, and she could be part of his concubinage. Uh, a lot of these people were parts of what were called harems, depending on the culture of the people. So these people come directly up under the idea of sex. Of course, there's nobody having sex all day long. So while they are not doing that, of course, they would be utilized for their services to help keep the place clean and do whatever needed to be done in the house to keep the house running. Because, of course, with the advent of more people, there's going to be more mess. And now we're going to have these people be the servant part as far as um, getting things in order in the house. But a lot of emphasis wasn't placed on what these were in historic times. Of course, children were vital because till today... They are used and abused for, yes, sex and power, okay? Men. Now, when we talk about the men for the king, okay, there were a few titles given to these male slaves. They were called bondsmen. They may have been called the um, chambermen. And groom of the stool. This is shrouded in mystery, a lot more mystery than we know about. Just like today, there are many men who engage in S-E-X with other men. 
and we're going to go more into detail as to how we can uncover what the term slave actually means. Now, mind you, when these captives uh, come into the territory of the new king, these were the first that were selected from the king and others could be sold to others. Okay. But of course, within the kingdom there are also other regiments of people that would be captured and utilized for their services as well so those come more under the item or the authority of the power dynamic and those could be people who they took for their military merchants These are agents of the, the royalty. Uh, they could also be craftsmen. So the people who were the carpenters and the blacksmiths, etc. These are also people who would be captured and utilized for their services. They may receive in return for their work some form of compensation it may have been land to till so they can make a farm and make their own get their own food they may have been provided food from others who were farmers that would provide the food in exchange for work or whatever was done there were more in what we would call the servant apprenticeship those were things that were also done where the young would go to these people and be uh, in the military over eight years old because children were definitely used um, in all of these things and they were not paid for their work. This more so deals with the power segment. However, a lot has not been talked about in reference to how the sex is the main driver and power secondary. Now I'm going to give you a quick disclaimer. When I was going to school, they taught me how to read for understanding, not just to read, to know what it says. There's a big difference between reading comprehension and just reading to see words. We're going to have to do a deep dive here because these terms are shrouded in a ton of mystery for some reason. So we're going to start off with a term maidservant. If you look up maidservant in the dictionary, you will see this is the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And it gives you just a basic definition. That's quite basic. Yes. We're going to do some investigation because there is much more to this term than meets the eye. We will find that if you just go to the dictionary and look up a word, you will miss the context of most of what it really, really means. Maidservant. Here are some synonyms of maidservant. Biddy, chairwoman, handmaid, housekeeper, maid, wench, char, handmaiden, housegirl, housemaid, and skivvy. Now, those may just seem like words to you and to me too. But when you have an understanding of the history of these words, you may have heard some of these words previously. Uh, we have the handmaiden's tale that should give you an idea of the type of behavior expected of a maidservant. The wench, too. They used to put a word in front of it, bed wench. But these are just basic understandings. And if you have no understanding of the depth of the words that are being used here, you are going to miss the big picture. This is where we're starting. And what I'm going to do is we're going to look at the context of this word maidservant. I just thought I'd show you a picture of what many people's uh, fantasy of a maidservant looks like. Uh, there's a reason for pictures like this to exist and for women all over to use this costume during uh, Halloween. There's even services that provide cleaning services where women dress like this or even more revealing. And there's a reason for that we're going to discuss. Let's go into some history. First, 
the kings, the kingship, the religious connection, and the law codes that were brought down to introduce the concept of slavery. Not saying that it began here. This is where we first see the writings in reference to slavery. The Code of Ernamu. It is said to be the oldest law code surviving today. It is in fragments. There are only a few codes still available that we can read today from this code of law that comes from 2100 to 2050 BCE. And it speaks to the connection between the royalty, the kingship, the religion, because if you see the curses that would be brought upon you by breaking these codes <laughs> and all the gods that supposedly um, would smite you if you break the code, you will see the connection there. Uh, but we're going to look at a couple of the rules, the laws, excuse me, the laws regarding slavery. I'm going to show you a few of them that we could uncover from this particular code here. Now, in general, I would advise you to go and read some of these laws because some of them are still in place today. And these laws also were connected with biblical law. And I will connect that for you in a moment. But let us look at just the idea of some of what was talked about in the Code of Ernamu. Um, we have here, if a slave marries a slave and then is set free, he does not leave the household. If a slave marries a native, i.e. a free person, a person who was not captured and brought into the king's territory, then he or she is to hand the firstborn over to his owner. Okay, so in this depiction, it gives us an idea of some of the codes that we talk about as far as slavery itself, the term itself. Now, as you can see here, this marriage, this is to procure and procreate more slaves because these people are not being married by choice. They don't get to marry on their own accord. They don't get to marry because of who they want to marry. This is something that is done to make more slaves and to keep people in captivity. Number eight, it says, if a man proceeded by force and deflowered the virgin female slave of another man, that man must pay five shekels of silver. So that is the uh, retribution for deflowering another man's female slave. Now again, I know this is still kind of in the air, but we're going to go deeper. Okay, stick with me. 300 years after the original law of ur -Namu, there were a set of codes called the Hammurabi codes. Okay, Hammurabi was another king who laid down his own laws and those laws, again, follow a number of the older laws there were a few different laws in between Hammurabi's code but these were laid down 300 years later after the codes of Ornamu and we're gonna go deeper into some of the things that a maid servant does for her master for example here's one of the rules or the laws it says but if a father during his lifetime have not said to the children which the maid servant bore him, my children, after the father dies, the children of the maid servant shall not share in the goods of the father's house with the children of the wife. Let's pause there for a second. Now, if this maid servant is only the house cleaner, is only the cook, is only the person who helps keep the house why are there laws in reference to the children she bores to her master it says the maid servant and her children shall be given their freedom okay this is if the master says that her children are my children during his time living now the children of the wife may not lay claim to the children of the maidservant for service. They no longer move forward in slavery. I'm going to make this very, very clear because 
it seems like they want to just say a maidservant is just a, a, a slave, a female slave. What does that mean? What is a female slave? This is a person that has children for the master. Another code, number 213 and 214. It talks about if, the, if a man strikes the maidservant of a man, if he strikes the maidservant of a man and she loses her child, he shall pay two shekels in money. If the maidservant dies, he shall pay one third of Amina. Now those numbers, we'll see, those, those are lesser than the wife. A, a wife is also a servant. She is just given a bit more authority than the maidservant. If she bore children to her husband, as we will see later. If she does not bear children to her husband, the maidservant has quite a big value to the master he should pay the master a certain fee and most often it's because that child belongs to the master and is going to be born a slave unless the master says my child so coming from some of the information in the Hammurabi's code um, we can see here what the woman's rights were in this codex it explains that a woman enters into marriage through a contract arranged by her family till today i think in the west the woman's family would pay for the wedding and from what i understand in india the same goes the the woman's family would give a dowry to the man and his family i think in africa they do it the opposite where the man's family would pay a dowry to the woman's family it is said here in this particular codex that she came with a dowry and the gifts given by the groom to the bride also came with her. So in this case, this um, woman would enter through contract and she would be the one bringing a dowry to the groom. Okay, Divorce was up to the husband, but after divorce, he then had to restore the dowry and provide her with an income and any children that came under the woman's custody which is why most men will not divorce and until today they are fighting the same premise because at this time it was up to the husband women didn't have the right to ask for divorce like they do today uh, but after the divorce, he had to restore her with the dowry she brought and provide her with an income and any children that was procured during their marriage would come under the woman's custody, which it's a bit different in traditionally African cultures. However, though, if the woman was considered a bad wife, she might be sent away or or and this bad wife you see it's in quote unquote okay this is by the words of the husband because it's his decision to call her a bad wife let's not forget or made a slave in the husband's house so the wife can be demoted to a slave in her husband's house okay okay so what does that mean what is the difference between a wife and a slave? Not much. Maybe the title? Okay. If a wife brought action against her husband for cruelty and neglect, she could have a legal separation if the case was proved. Okay. Now, could you imagine how she would prove that? Could you just... Give me an idea of what you think in, in those times when women really this was an overthrow of everything that was egalitarian and matriarchal. Could you imagine what she would have to do to separate and prove her uh, neglect and the cruelty get done to her by her husband? Again, I'm going to recommend you go and read all of the codes of Hammurabi because you will find some very interesting rules and laws in that code as far as how people are I guess you could say tried for their offenses but here is an example 
otherwise she might be drowned as punishment okay so a wife who could not prove cruelty and neglect from her husband would be drowned as punishment adultery was punished with drowning of both parties unless a husband was willing to pardon his wife so i mean this this talk is not necessarily about uh marriage so i just wanted to give you an idea of even a wife is a slave with another title and I want to make it clear that that's what that is. Okay, now in this code, number 146, it says, If a man takes a wife and she gives this man a maidservant as a childbearer, and the maidservant does bear him children, then this maid assumes equality with the wife because she has borne him children. Her master shall not sell her for money, but he may keep her as a slave, reckoning her among the maid servants. If this does not give us a clear understanding that the servitude or the maid service is most focused on her ability to be a child bearer, to bring children to master of course yes she's gonna have to cook and clean and all those other duties but let's not forget she definitely has a role to play as far as assisting uh, the hus the master <laughs> or husband which you want to call him uh, in bringing children okay and I know you saw that 147 if she has not borne him children then she may continue to be sold to another for money, which is what we know that servants are sold, bought and sold as commodities left and right. So yeah, that's the wife doing so in this scenario, not the, not the master as the, the man himself. The Ardu was a slave. So it depends on the language you're speaking in different tongues. It's called different words that he could acquire property and even hold other slaves. So he as a male slave could acquire property and even hold other slaves. His master clothed and fed him and paid his doctor's fees, but took all compensation paid for injury done to him. His master usually found him a slave girl as wife the children were then born slaves, often set him up in a house with farm or business and simply took an annual rent of him. Otherwise, he might marry a free woman. The children were then free, who might bring him a dower that his master could not touch. And at his death, one half of his property passed to his master as his heir. He could acquire freedom, his freedom, by purchase from his master, or might be freed and dedicated to a temple, or even adopted and made to uh, Amalu and not Amuskinu. So those are terms that we're not going to discuss. But this is the idea behind a he um, slave. Uh, we're going to go more into depth in that in a moment. But a slave who is chattel to a master could also acquire property so then you see how the the problem with our historical narrative is that there's a lot of clouding of the titles and the ways that things are represented to keep you confused to keep all of us confused i think men understand men understand i think women we we have a hard time understanding what's going on here because we don't understand the nature of men so this was the main ways that slaves were acquired either you purchase them you go somewhere else and you purchase them uh, they were captives taken from war between kingdoms or if a person did a crime they were to become a slave okay as I mentioned before men would go into other territories and take captives and either keep the first bulk for themselves and sell the rest other men would come to purchase slaves 
and this would continue territory to territory all across the planet because there were things to do once you have a large group of people now joining a new community there's going to be a lot to do and you're going to need workers so yes there is a part that has to do with workmanship and having people come and work with no pay or little pay um, I'm going to leave this page here there's a lot that goes into it I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read it to you but you can take a look at some of the other things that were required of these people that were captives, prisoners of war, that come from one kingship to another, and what happened to them. And I do recommend you go onto the Hammurabi Code and read through the information in regards to the temple. I just left a small snippet here. I'm not going to read this too because this is not what this is about. Maybe I can do, if you request it in the comments, I can do a whole nother video in reference to uh, the temple and the religious part that connects the kingship and connects slavery and how men utilize this to overthrow the planet but we are just here to give the basics in reference to slavery i'm going to keep going now i know some of you might be saying what is this hammurabi code what is the code of ur namu but most people they give all of the credence to the b-i-b-l-e so we're going to talk about the maidservant in reference to your holy book the bible Okay, this is just a basic overview of what they called the maidservant. It gives us a clue as to her role in the Bible. Maidservant means simply a female slave in the different positions which such a woman naturally occupies. Those are very cryptic words because if you hear a lot of people till today, they talk about what role a woman quote unquote naturally occupies giving birth which again rolls it back to sex because a woman has no other value other than to make children right it says here they were the property of their masters sometimes held the position of concubine there is no other terminology for what a concubine is other than a sex worker uh, daughters might be sold by their fathers into this condition. This is very clear. Slavery, kingship, men's power and control, men's urge, their motivating force being sex and power. Now, why a maidservant's role is what it is. Now, here is a reference from the Jewish Encyclopedia, and this is redirected from the term bondman. And I'm gonna uncover bondman separately, but we're getting the introduction as to the connection between the maidservant and the bondman. Here, where the word ebed, the Hebrew word, really means slave, but the Bible renders it servant. So it's telling you here, that a bondman, his condition is far above that of slavery. Where real slaves are referenced to, English versions generally use bondman for ebed and bondwoman or bondmaid for the corresponding feminines. The duty of treating the Hebrew servant and handmaid otherwise than slaves and above all their retention in service for a limited time only was deemed by the lawgiver of such importance that the subject was put next to the decalogue at the very head of civil blah 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 handmade we've seen this term we've seen the term servant we've seen the term bondsman being compared to bondwoman or bondmaid and also the feminines we also see maidservant so there's a lot of wordplay going on in these descriptions that cause a lot of confusion. But if you are following me and if you are comprehending, you're going to get what I'm putting down. At the end of this last paragraph, before we go into the Hebrew bond made to give a description of what her duties were, <laughs> um, 
We see the end of a paragraph here because it says here when a uh, man is told by the court, the master is bound to furnish such a servant's wife with food. He's having, it seems, the right to her services, which hitherto belonged to her husband. So one of the things that the man gets from selling his male servant or the court so is sold by the court so that the king sells his male servant he is due the rights that he was getting from that woman's husband she now belongs to him she now provides the same services to him we're going to talk about his services in a moment but if you're getting what i'm putting down the Hebrew bondmaid, let's start to read this. According to the tradition, a Hebrew female may not be sold by the court for theft, nor may she sell herself. She may be sold for a bondmaid only in the one way shown. And that means when a man sells his daughter for a bondmaid, quote unquote, maid servant. So according to the tradition, this is the difference between the captives versus the people that are already like the natives, the people who are in the kingdom that they consider their own. The girl must be sold by her father. The father has this power over his daughter only while she is a minor that is less than 12 years of age or at least while she has not bear the signs of puberty so this man according to this it says he should only use this right in the extreme of poverty and then as a last resort before selling himself but let's be real these fathers before the young lady has reached maturity that's when he has the right okay he has the right to sell his daughter to become a maidservant because if, if it's after puberty he no longer has that right let that sink deep into your understanding the sale becomes complete by the delivery of money or money's worth through a deed written in the father's name the girl remains in service at most six years quote unquote like a man servant what now we know that this those girls weren't always discharged okay unless maybe they call her a old maid at that point quote unquote old maid we wonder where those terms come from if a master dies although he leaves a son she goes free why do you think that that's important to know what does him having a son have to do with her being set free if the master dies if we didn't understand before we're going to read exactly what happens to this bondmaid. In quotes it said, Thou shalt do likewise to thy bondmaid. But over, end quotes, But over and above all these paths to liberty, she has another. So she has all these paths to liberty. Great, great, great. If she, you know, uh, six years and she goes free or if the jubilee arrives before the expiration of that term she goes free or if the master dies she goes free so they're looking at it like wow she has all these options now mind you, this is a little girl a little girl prior to the age of puberty prior to 12 years of age okay as soon as her signs of puberty appear, the master must marry her or must betroth her to his son or must send her free. S E 
X has everything to do with slavery. But I want to bring your attention to the conclusion and the comparison between the bondmaid and the manservant. It is not clear, but you can see if you're reading with comprehension. It says here, in conclusion, it may be said of Hebrew manservants and bondsmaids, okay? That they do not become free by reason of an assault on the part of the master, which results in the loss of an eye or tooth. Um, blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah is important, but the reason I want to bring your attention to that is why do they continue to connect the manservant and the bondsmaid? I also mentioned a term called a concubine. Let's read what a purpose of a concubine. It says mostly concubines served to satisfy the sexual pleasure. And since any children that resulted from a mistress was considered illegitimate and unless allowed by their father, they had no rights of inheritance. The father or the master says these are my children then they have some rights but if the master says these are he doesn't speak those words during his lifetime then the children of the concubine i.e the servant maid servant i.e slave has no the children have no rights the rich and the ruling class almost exclusively practiced concubinage this was a this was a motivating factor again a motivating factor for men sex and power until today we see this still the structure is still in place we use different terms but it is very much still in place we call them baby mamas let's not forget hagar hagar was a slave and abraham's concubine who gave birth to his son ishmael this is definitely copied and, and produced in your Bible. In many stories, actually, you have many, many stories in there. But I think this one might be very much understandable for those of you who read the Bible. Concubinage diverged from a free quasi-marital cohabitation to the extent that it was forbidden to a free woman to be involved in the concubinage and the institution was reserved only to slaves. So we now know the word and what it was for, but now we have an understanding that this was also a form of slavery. This type of concubinage was practiced in patriarchal cultures throughout history till today. Many societies automatically freed the concubine after she had a child. Again, that would depend on the master, wouldn't it? It says, according to one study, this was the case of about one third of the slave holding societies, the most prominent being the case of the Muslim world. Uh, yeah, yeah. In slave owning societies, most concubines were slaves. Now, it says, but not all. Let's, let's, let's really think about that. Uh, it even lets us know here, dubious and disgust. Because <laughs> they know it's not true. They're putting that and they know it's not true. The feature about concubinage that made it attractive to certain men was that the concubine was dependent on the man she could be sold or punished at the master's will that was the prime feature however quote unquote and i will say this really loosely the practice declined as a result of the abolition of slavery so nowadays we do know we we don't really have the term concubine being used but I'll tell you, it is still happening till today. They speak about ancient Rome, but we're in ancient Rome because if you talk about concubinage, 
It referred to any extramarital sexual relationship. And even though it says here that it's most often between wealthy and powerful or politically powerful man and a woman of low, the we get the picture, don't we? As we continue, the term concubine has m almost exclusively been applied to women, although a male may also be a concubine. And that's the part that is way more shrouded in mystery in history. Let us not think that men have not always, always enjoyed being with other men. And that's the part that I want to make clear here today because that has been shrouded in so much secrecy that the words we use seem to have us confused. We're going to go into harems shortly, but I wanted to make note of what it speaks to as far as harems in this article here. It, in harems of the past, slave concubines were also housed in the harems. And in former times, some harems were guarded by eunuchs who were allowed inside. Now, a eunuch I submit was also part of the harem but a eunuch had more privileges because a eunuch was a male a castrated male a eunuch would have only testicles castrated and sometimes both testicles and penis castrated but they were much they were given much more privileges than the women let's be clear because of their maleness they were utilized as servants to while they're not doing their duties as a concubine they were also utilized to guard quote unquote the women okay so a harem is when we look at the definition that is given to us it's a separate part of a muslim household reserved for wives concubines and female servants as we know eunuchs okay let's not forget them because they were also parts of the harem for a man this harem idea was also shrouded in mystery because of course, it is horrible to think of a man having a uh, man in an sexual way. So, one of the things that is, you know, part of the power dynamic is for a man to have a harem. But yet, we're going to hide the fact that he also has eunuchs in there. Most royal courts had a harem where the ruler's wives and concubines lived with men or in seclusion from the rest of the court in the way associated with the term harem. Now, we're talking about in terms of slavery, we're talking in terms of sex and power because there were also times in past where women and men held separate quarters but this is in the terms of the kingship and the captivity and the overthrow of times when women had freedom this freedom was taken it says here the custom of referring to the woman's quarters of the pharaoh's palace as a harem is therefore apocryphal and has been used because of incorrect assumptions that ancient Egypt was similar to later Islamic harem culture. So I guess this is kind of what that's speaking to. For me, I don't know for a fact that ancient Egypt had the idea of the freedom of the woman, but I think it more so does than any culture that came after it. Women had freedom. Although men have always been motivated by sex and power 
that there had been a modern trend to refer to the women's quarters of the Pharaoh's palace in ancient Egypt as a harem. We need separation from men most times to be able to keep ourselves going well. While the women and children of the Pharaoh, including his mother and wives, children had their own living quarters with its own administration in the palace of the Pharaoh, the royal women did not live isolated from contact with men or in seclusion from the rest of the court in the way associated with the term harem. Because harem is really a prisoner. A prisoner that doesn't have, again, a slave. They don't have the rights to go as they pleased. Whereas this article is getting us the understanding that although the women and children of the Pharaoh would have their separate quarters, it wasn't in a way where they were enslaved to be secluded from the rest of society. Although most royal courts had a harem where the ruler's wives and concubines lived with female attendants and eunuchs, this term is used to describe the practices in the uh, ancient Near East because of its slavery and its degradation of the freedom of women and some men. And let's not forget the children. These contexts do not specify that children were to utilize for SEX, but let us comprehension. That's all I'll say about that for now. Now, we've talked about the servant, the maid servant. We've talked about the handmaid and all of these terms that we use to explain. And I hope that you understand and have comprehended what I've laid out to this point. Now let's talk about the male servants. When we talk about the manservant, well, this is what uh, Google says is the opposite of the maidservant, okay? Or the gender, the opposite gender of the maidservant is the manservant. Going back to Hammurabi's code, I just wanna bring forward one of the laws that gave me pause. It says here, if the wife of a man be taken in lying with another man, so if a woman is cheating on her man, they shall bind them and throw them into the water. And again, I, I do urge you to go and read these codes because they are very eye-opening. But if the husband of the woman Let's, let's, let's understand this clearly. If the master or the husband of the woman okay, should save his wife or if the king would save his male servant, he may. Why? When we're talking about a woman laying with another man, and the husband saving his wife, why would the king saving his male servant have anything to do with this? The king's male servant is the one sleeping with the man's wife, right? Maybe he is. Or maybe he's his concubine. The king's concubine. Just like the wife is the husband slave the bondman we're given a very basic and generic uh, definition as to what a bondman is again shrouded in mystery someone bound to labor without wages another term for a bondman is a slave or serf let's go back to our understanding that we got from our jewish encyclopedia Okay, the Jewish Encyclopedia, let's remind ourselves what the word bondman uh, speaks to. Okay, the Hebrew word means slave. The Bible refers to it as servant. It is a pious man 
being servants of the Lord and courtiers being servants of the king. It is referred to as similar or corresponding to the term for bondwoman or bondmaid or the feminines. Okay, The treatment of the Hebrew servant and had made otherwise than as slaves and above all their retention in service for a limited time only. So we are coupling the handmaid, the servant, the slave, the bondman. Let's just say, anytime you go into the Bible and you see maid servant, either before or shortly after the bondsman word is also there associated with it. And lastly, there's so much that we could go into. So we're going to end this discourse talking about the groom of the stool. It was the king's close stool. It is said to be of the English monarchs, but let's not be daft. This was something that goes throughout kingship. They may have had different terms or names for this position, but it definitely is a person that is said to be the closest to the king. Now, in general, they describe this position as the most intimate of an English monarch's courtiers responsible for assisting the king in excretion and hygiene. So this person is helping the king with his excretions from his private places. It says that the physical intimacy of the role naturally led to his becoming a man in whom much confidence was placed by his royal master and with whom many royal secrets were shared as a matter of course. Mm, very intimate position. This person is right there with the king. This secret information, while it would never have been revealed, for it would have led to the discredit of his honor. So let's, let's just keep in mind, this is the most intimate. Ever heard of the term pillow talk? Mm, okay. In turn, led to his becoming feared and respected, and therefore very powerful within the royal court in his own right. So, this person, whomever the king chose as his groom of the stool, or whatever the term was called in other places, this person had the most intimate, even more so than the queen. The queen would have been or the king's wife whomever would have the children for the king that would be out of duty this is a more intimate position than even that the office developed gradually over decades and centuries into one of the administration of the royal finances and under henry the seventh the groom of the stool became a powerful official involved in settling national fiscal policy under the chamber system. So remember I mentioned the chamberman. Um, this is where that ties in together. Now the groom of the stool was a male servant in the household of the English monarch. And again, don't negate that this position goes for any kingship. If the king would always have a right hand man, as we would call it, and was responsible for assisting the king in his toileting needs. That is code. It is a matter of some debate as to whether the duties involved cleaning the king's anus, but the groom is known to have been responsible for supplying a bowl, water, and towels, and also monitoring the king's diet and bowel movements, and liaising with the royal doctor about the king's health. When you have an understanding of male nature, you can see where this closeness can evolve to. The appellation groom of the close stool derived from the item of furniture used as a toilet. It also appears as groom of the stool as the word groom comes from 
the old low Franconian work Groms. By the Tudor age, the role of the groom of the stool was fulfilled by a substantial figure. In the early days of Henry VIII's reign, the title was awarded to court companions of the king who spent time with him in the privy chamber. But the privy chamber really had to do with his restroom and bedchamber. Yeah, this is where the king slept and used the toilet. These were generally the sons of noblemen or important members of gentry. In time, they came to act as virtual personal secretaries to the king, carrying out a variety of administrative tasks within his private rooms. This is even more intimate than anyone else. This person had the king's ear. They also were able to hear the king in his most intimate moments. This position was an especially prized one as it allowed unobstructed access to the king. David Starkey writes, the groom of the stool had to our eyes the most menial tasks. His standing though was the highest. Clearly then the royal body service must have been seen as entirely honorable without a trace of the demeaning or the humiliating. And there's a reason for this understanding. Everyone thinks this guy is just wiping his, the king's bum, 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 see, batum. But he got the highest standing, especially as another man or boy, you earn a good position. Further, the mere word of the gentleman of the privy chamber was sufficient evidence in itself of the king's will. So all he had to do was say that's his title and he can give orders and it was so. The groom of the stool bore the indefinable charisma of the monarchy. The office was exclusively one serving male monarchs. And so on the ascension of his Elizabeth the first of England in 1558, it was replaced by the first lady of the bedchamber. However, the office effectively came to an end when it was neutralized in 1559, one year later. As we can see, the first lady didn't feel the need to have this position. It just didn't make sense to her. If you go look up the grooms of the stool, you will see there's a long line of grooms of the stool going all throughout the monarchies till there was a female a first lady. In Scotland, the valets of the chamber, like John Gibb, had an equivalent role. On the ascension of James I, the male office was revived. Mm. Gentleman of the bedchamber, who always was a great nobleman, he was a great nobleman, <laughs> who had considerable power because of its intimate access to the king. Absolutely sex and power. During the reign of Charles I, the term stool appears to have lost its original signification of chair because that wasn't what was happening. It just had to be the right hand man or the intimate partner of the king. From 1660, the office of groom of the stool revived with the restoration of the monarchy was invariably coupled with that of first gentleman or lady of the bedchamber as effective head of the royal bedchamber the groom of the stool was a powerful individual who had the right to attend the monarch at all times and to regulate access to his or her private quarters this was a servant that had more rights than anyone else in the kingdom Incongruously, the office of Groom of the Stool continued in use during the reign of Queen Anne when it was held by a duchess who combined its duties with those of Mistress of the Robes. Under the Manoverians, the Groom of the Stool began to be named in the London Gazette. In 1726, John Chamberlain wrote that the Lord Chamberlain has oversight of all officers belonging to the king's chamber 
the precinct of the king's bedchamber is wholly under the groom of the stole. Chamberlain defines the groom of the stole as the first of the gentlemen of the bedchamber. Translating his title from the Greek as groom or servant of the long robe or vestment. He explains that he has the office and honor to present and put on his majesty's first garment or shirt every morning and to order the things of the bedchamber. This person was even more intimate than anyone else. And if you have ears to hear, you understand where I'm going with this, please. The office again fell into abeyance with the ascension of Queen Victoria, although her husband, Prince Albert, and their son, Edward, Prince of Wales, employed similar courtiers oh my so the queen didn't have any but her husband and their son had one they needed help going to the bathroom getting their shirt on in the morning someone to help hold their member while they use the bathroom make sure they have fresh water and towels and take care of their hygiene if you know a man's nature but when Edward ascended or acceded to the throne as King Edward VII in 1901, he discontinued the office. As to my premise that men created slavery, slavery has always been about S-E-X. Yes, power is definitely a part of it. Work is definitely a part of it. But when you understand that the foundational motivation for men is sex and power in that order, it gives you a better idea of why slavery was created, why it continues till today. We don't use the same terminology. Wives, yes, we still use that terminology. And yes, wives are still in very many ways slaves. Concubines, we no longer use that terminology. We just call them baby mamas or mother of your child or mistress. Mm, we may use that term mistress. Harems, well, because of the nuclear family, harems were broken up in many places. Women being in separate quarters under imprisonment, enslavement are not as big as it used to be. However, in many cultures, you still have variations of harems where polygamous men might have their wives instead of giving them each their own homes. He may have them all together in his own harem. Eunuchs, well, we still have men that are moved here and there for the reasons of SEX, whether paid or unpaid grooms of the stool those are just for the people who have money sugar daddy doesn't only designate a woman being paid for this type of work a male could also be a sugar baby we have all sorts of different terms and different forms of whether payment would be given and it's just a service and they are considered servants or indentured servants or all of these social media platforms are very sensitive but we have child tea happening all over the globe human tea happening all over the globe sex s e x t happening all over the globe people are being groomed and moved and many of them without even knowing that that's what's happening to them. And it is big business till today. Thank you for listening. Leave a comment, subscribe, follow me, and I'll talk to you in the next video.